After days of, um, some might say, uncharacteristic silence and perhaps a little more common prevarication and bluster, the First Minister last night finally alighted on a defence of his position to support Rupert Murdoch's bid to take over B Sky B. It is, he says, because it would have created jobs in Scotland. Can the First Minister tell us when he first articulated this view in public and how many jobs did James Murdoch promise him? First Minister. Well, the uh, importance of the, the issue was first uh, uh, discussed, as we know, from the emails released on the 1st of November 2010. The email which says that uh, a Liberal MP, we now think it was a Liberal MSP, wanted to take forward the importance of jobs and investment in Scotland to the Secretary of State, and I very much agreed with that position. Uh, then, of course, Joanne Lamont will remember the correspondence we released at the meeting I had with James Murdoch, Murdoch last, November, last January, a year past January, which looked in particular uh, at the prospects of, of employment uh, in Scotland, adding to the 6,300 jobs that Sky B employ in Dunfermline, Uddingston and Livingston. She will, of course, recall the announcement of a further 100 jobs uh, uh, last March which added to the Livingston total. But I hope that Joanne Lamont is also aware of the further significance to jobs in Scotland, because one of the issues that was being discussed last year uh, was that BSkyB B were moving from nine contractors to two contractors, uh, and that carried with it the risk, it was for security reasons, but carried with the risk of major job losses in Scotland, unless Scotland won the contracts. I'm delighted to say, of course, that Hero TSC did win the major contract, leading to this last week's announcement, and I'll quote it to Joanne Lamont, Glasgow's newest employers today officially opened their state-of-the-art contact centre in the city and vowed to bring 900 jobs to the Atlantic Quay site. Hero TSC's leading management company announced last month they were coming to Glasgow after expanding their contact centre to provide sales and support service to B Sky B. I hope at least Joanne Lamont will welcome these huge number of jobs coming to the city of Glasgow. Joanne Lamont. I always welcome jobs coming to my own city. I also welcome when the First Minister answers the question he was asked. And I wait for that day to happen. It, perhaps it may happen at some point in the future. Because, of course, the reason he can't tell us when the first time he articulated this view in public was because the first time he did articulate that view in public was last night. And it was less of a reason, more of an alibi. And while the First Minister claims this was about gaining jobs, Rupert Murdoch says he spoke to the First Minister to apologise for cutting jobs. But of course, not everyone agreed with what the First Minister now says, that this deal would be good for Scotland. I have here a motion to the Scottish Parliament from October 2010, signed by the constituency MSP for B Sky B's biggest Scottish base, Angela Constance, now the First Minister's Employment Minister, a motion which imposes the new international deal. Yet SNP policy, we seem to appear, had changed by 1st of November because we know that from Frederick Michel's emails that it was mission accomplished and the First Minister was prepared to lobby Vince Cable on Murdoch's behalf. We know this was still the position in February and in March and that Alex Salmond had a call scheduled with the new Culture Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. Yet on July 13th last year, all six of Alex Salmond's MPs at Westminster supported a motion asking Rupert Murdoch to withdraw their bid for B Sky B. So if this was really such a good job for Scotland, as the First Minister said last night, that jobs relied on it, why did the First Minister support his own MPs in opposing the deal? First Minister. Because that was after Order, the we will hear the First Minister. Because that was after the revelations of phone hacking and Millie Dowler. And I thought that is patently obvious. Now, the interesting thing about Jan Lamont is, I mean, I can understand her perhaps not being fully aware of the importance of jobs in Uddingston and Dunfermline and Livingston. But why on earth is she not aware of the importance of jobs in the city of Glasgow? 
What Rupert Murdoch was referring to in the evidence yesterday was exactly the point that my first answer alluded to, and that is the fact that the Sky contract was going from nine centres to two centres. That carried with it the huge risk last year of losing thousands of Scottish jobs. Fortunately, Hero TSC won the contract, leading to the opening of the call centre and supply centre in Glasgow. 900 jobs to the Atlantic Key site. Now, John Lamont may not be aware of it, but I know Sandra White is, because it's in her constituency. I know her deputy, Anna Sarwar, whose constituency in, presumably is aware of 900 jobs coming to his constituency. Now, as John Lamont says, we have now talked about this, we published correspondence with the, uh, James Murdoch months ago, which showed that the meeting in London concerned the protection and the expansion of jobs in Dunfermline and Livingston. John Lamont may not think these things are important. I think it's the job of a First Minister to advocate yes, jobs yes, for yes. Scotland, and I'll continue to do so. John Lamont, back with another question. We will hear Ms Lamont. Joanne Lamont. I don't think the First Minister listened to what I said. His own employment minister, representing Livingston, opposed the deal. His own MPs opposed the deal. I welcome jobs coming to Glasgow, but they've got nothing to do with this issue of News International. And the First Minister says that the reason the position changed was because of Millie Dowler. Well, the revelation that Rupert Murdoch's newspaper hacked Millie Dowler's phone was the moment that any doubt about Rupert Murdoch was removed. It was the moment his empire started to fall. And yet, after that devastating revelation, the First Minister became the only senior politician in this country, perhaps the only one in the world, to invite him round for tea. Newspapers, his newspapers might be being investigated for bribery, perverting the course of justice, destroying evidence and perjury, but Rupert's still welcome in We Ex House. And he writes an article in the launch of his newspaper saying it wasn't just News International, it's all of the newspaper industry. So there may, there may be three police investigations going on and a judicial inquiry and nearly 50 arrests, but ek, Eck still puts a kettle on for Rupert. Doesn't the First Minister realise that all he is achieving is to demean the office he craved for so long? First Minister? Yes, I, 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 I remember writing the article on the Sun and Sunday. It was followed the next week by Yvette Cooper, who wrote a very <laughs> interesting article I, I, indeed. But I know that the Labour Party would wish us to pretend that the days of, uh, of uh, courting the, the murder press were all back in the days of Tony Blair uh, and Gordon Brown. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't fit with the facts. William Shawcross, who's the uh, Rupert Murdoch's biographer, writing in The Spectator, the 16th of July, quote, Ed Miliband was beaming when I saw him talking to Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> at the Media Magnet summer party at the Orangery in Kensington Palace just three weeks ago. The Labour leader has since admitted he did not raise the matter of phone hacking that evening. Of course not. He was trying to charm. It's rather like uh, this picture of uh, Ed Miliband advocating the sun, advocating and looking for support from the sun, declaring Red Ed is dead. <laughs> I will stand and my party will stand from the mainstream of Britain for Sun readers and their concerns. He refused to put a date when a new set of policies would be ready. He says you'll read about it first in the Sun. So I, I think... I, I think this 15 years of worshipping at the feet of Rupert Murdoch from the Labour Party, now treating him as a pariah, Refusing to explain the canopies, the energy. Refusing to explain 
the contacts over the period. Order. I would really like to hear the First nobody. Minister. What people in Scotland will see when they see Joanne Lambert, the Labour Party's words and think of, they'll think of humbug and hypocrisy. Another question for Joanne. She's on her feet again. Lots of applause in the chamber here. Joanne Lamont. I hate to think what they'll think of that performance. Can I say on the question of Ed Miliband, as I remind him again, Ed Miliband put down a motion opposing the deal. The First Minister's own MPs also supported that deal. Now, I'm not going to ask the First Minister if he supported Murdoch so that Murdoch's son supported him. The public will have made up their own minds on that. But isn't the truth, this is not about the First Minister's evident cynicism, which we've seen in the past, but his infatuation with very rich men. First, first, he gave his office full backing to the then Sir Fred Goodwin in the deal that brought the bank. Who can forget, who can forget, who can forget? Order, we will hear Miss Lamont. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of this in the backbench of the SNP comes as much of a revelation to them as it did to us. <laughs> Who can forget, even without yesterday's reminder, the deal with Donald Trump, now murder? Now, there are common themes here. Each case, each case was secret. Each deal was a fiasco. And in each case, case, the truth had to be dragged out of the First Minister, bit by bit. Big deals. Big men. One not quite so big man. No jobs just job losses. He says it's about jobs. I think he just likes rich men. Some say, some say the minister, First Minister has been devious, conniving, double dealing. Isn't he just trying to cover up the fact that a rich man has played him for a fool again? It's not, is it not the case that he's no statesman, just a sucker? First Minister. Well, okay, okay, First uh, Minister. The, the reference to, to job losses, of course, was a reference back to the, the first question and answer that Joanne Lambert didn't take in. The, the fear that there was going to be substantial job losses as a result of the contracts going from nine to two. I read out the extensive detail. The fact that, thankfully, Hero TSC won the contract and a 900-job call centre has been opened in the city of Glasgow. Did not just Joanne Lamont didn't know that the first question, she didn't realise it answered it for her second question, and she now repeats it in her pre-prepared uh, fourth uh, question. Now, talking about uh, Fred Goodwin, that would be Sir Fred Goodwin, knighted uh, by Gordon Brown on the advice of Jack McConnell. And, and Donald Trump, up until this last Sunday, Donald Trump's argument to the Scottish Government is that we were bound by a deal that he claimed had been made between him and Lord McConnell in the previous administration. I, I really do think Joanne Lamont should understand and perhaps inform Lord McConnell and Donald Trump that we are not bound by the policies of the last administration and thank goodness for that in Scotland. But I'll tell Joanne Lamont one thing that would be consistent with any First Minister of Scotland, and that is that they would put the interests of Scotland first and the interests of jobs first. Yeah. Now, how do I know this? Well, John Lambert was interviewed in Good Morning Scotland yesterday, and let me read out the exchange so the Chamber understands it. Gary Robertson, would you, if you were First Minister, heaven forfend, that was the Gary Robertson, that was me. <laughs> be meeting Rupert Murdoch and others to talk about jobs in Scotland. Joanne Lamont, well, you'd have to meet people to talk about jobs. Oh! And there we have it, the whole cant, humbug, hypocrisy. The job of a First Minister is to advocate jobs for Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This First Minister will continue to do it. Matt Bencher is giving the First Minister a uh, thunderous applause there. Now it's time for Ruth Davidson, the Conservative leader, for her question. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. No plans, immediate future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Well, while we're on the topic of New York-based billionaires, uh, the First Minister was asked in January of 2008 by the Local Government and Communities Committee if he'd ever met, prior to the previous December, any members of the Trump organisation. He replied 
that he had met representatives at the many estates on the 24th of September 2007. No mention of the Donald, no mention of candlelit Manhattan dinners, no mention of talking for hours on the favoured subjects of golf and wind farms. That dinner occurred just three months before that committee meeting. Did the First Minister intentionally mislead Parliament, or did he just forget, in the glory of supping with Murdoch one night, that he'd been supping with Trump the next? First Minister. I'm sorry to disabuse Ruth Davison of the idea of a, a candlelit dinner between my, myself and Donald Trump. Uh, th this was a global Scott dinner in New York. Uh, attending uh, the event were the Alexandra Real Estates, uh, the General Electric, uh, the head of Discovery Research of YF Research, McKinsey and Company, uh, the Morgan Stanley Banking Corporation. Uh, I don't think it sounds the likely venue uh, to be exchanging uh, commitments in terms of a, of a planning application five years uh, down the road. Let me repeat, uh, this government have never given any assurances against a planning application for offshore wind uh, in Aberdeen. I cannot speak for the previous administration, but the most significant thing in terms of validating that position is as follows. Uh, in February of this year, I wrote to him afterwards, after receiving a, a number of letters uh, from the Donald, I had a phone conversation with him and I was trying to work out the nature of his ferocious opposition, not just apparently uh, to offshore wind, uh, offshore Aberdeen, but to wind power in general, uh, which seemed to be a new phenomenon. And right through that phone call, he accepted that he'd never had any commitments from this administration, but he considered us bound by the commitment of the previous administration. Uh, an issue which was maintained and sustained by spokesman George Sorio right through last week in a BBC interview. And only on Sunday was it decided that a global Scott event attended by many others was the moment at which this commitment would be given. I think that's rather unlikely. I think for the first time in her life, Ruth Davidson has paid attention to the advice of Murdo Fraser. And if this is the best that Murdo Fraser can do, I suggest she gets a new advisor. <laughs> Ruth Davidson. Well, up well, at if the, the bank, First then. Minister has nothing to hide from a 12-man dinner, then why not tell the committee about it just three months later? The First Minister, in his overweening self-regard, never knowingly undersells what he thinks or believes to be his own political gifts. And I don't think even Mr Salmond himself thought that he could had the skills to make Donald Trump look credible. We know that the dinner that Alex Salmond failed to disclose to the committee took place, and thank you for finally now admitting it. We know that he and Donald talked for hours. We know that they talked about golf. We know that they talked about wind farms. Is the First Minister seriously asking the Scottish people to believe that when a multi-billionaire attracted to Scotland with great fanfare by his predecessor was threatening to pull the plug as soon as he took office, that he didn't like some latter-day Arthur Daly tell his new best pal that he would get it sorted? Something here stinks, presiding officer. Will the First Minister set the record straight and state categorically before this chamber that no such discussions on the planning or on the wind farms took place? First Minister. No, no discussion, no assurances were ever given in that light. But I think Drew Davis had better get the timeline right. Uh, the Donald hasn't been threatening to pull out of the Berry estate uh, until the last few months. Uh, and there's been a variety of reasons uh, given uh, for his, not his decision to pull out of the golf course, incidentally, development, which by all accounts looks absolutely wonderful. But first of all, it was Michael Forbes' uh, Croft, which was the reason for not having the hotel development. It's only very recently uh, that we've alighted on his uh, opposition uh, to the uh, uh, government's uh, policy of, of, uh, of renewable energy. And if she cares to check the record, that wasn't even the position of the Trump organisation in a, a letter they wrote uh, just uh, a year or so uh, ago. But I was very struck by this thing uh, about credible. Now, I have to confess, I only saw the, the excerpts of the, uh, uh, of the evidence session yesterday. But I was struck by the, the, the question uh, when the, uh, Donald Trump was asked, you know, what is the evidence for this great... Uh, difficulty in Scottish tourism, uh, and he says, I am the evidence. Uh, and I have to say, it struck me not so much as credible, a bit like the Judge Dredd view of, of tourism in Scotland. I think people in Scotland, when they look at this issue, 
will look at jobs and development. They'll see the announcements today for the Murray Firth. They'll see the prospect of 28,000 jobs in offshore wind. And it will be a shame on the Conservative Party in Scotland that while their colleagues in London are supporting such developments, Ruth Davidson and her colleagues don't want to see these developments and these massive jobs in green energy in Scotland. A supplementary question from Willie Rennie. This is the leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. I hear what the First Minister says about Millie Dowler. So does he regret that terrible article in The Sun where he played down the role of Rupert Murdoch's papers in phone hacking. Is he ashamed that he put his political motives above those of the phone hacking victims? First Minister. Well, my uh, opposition revulsion about phone hacking is well on the record many times. I can supply that to, to, to Spice. Of course, I supported the establishment of the Leveson Inquiry. Indeed, though, we had to comment on the terms of reference uh, of the Leveson Inquiry. Uh, I, I think the deplorable aspect of whole phone hacking will be fully dealt with at the inquiry, and I hope fully dealt with by uh, the police force and the judicial system on both sides of the border. But I have to say to Willie Rennie, if given the evidence that's coming before Leveson, and particularly the insight we had into it from ITN just a few weeks ago, of the extent of the payments made by a number of news organisations in terms of investigators for suspected breaches and criminality, I really think that one of the things I am certain is going to come out of the Leveson inquiry is there were widespread malpractice and widespread potential illegality across the press. That seems to me evident, and I hope and believe that Leveson Inquiry will pursue that without fear and without favour.